Richard Cresson ou les Gamelé. Du revoir. Et c'est quoi le film, I suppose it's a well-known cliche by now in, in all sorts of circles that Dylan is supposed to be very difficult to translate into visual terms. Uh, would you agree with this? Well, it's difficult to say. He obviously thought in visual terms, you know. And, uh, I actually once saw a painting done by Dylan, uh, which uh, still exists in New York. And there's uh, an extraordinary picture. You, you can't really uh, work it out at first glance until you look at the caption, because you see a lot of funny shapes. Then you see a coastline and a sea. And then the caption says, whales over whales. <laughs> Uh, he obviously thought in visual terms because quite clearly this whole piece is uh, visually thought of, even though it's written for voices. Yes, under Milkwood, uh, to a reader, it's very visual, and to a, to a listener of, a ra of the radio, but is it going to be difficult to tra translate into visual terms for a film? Because I think there have been many television productions, but I don't think I'm being unkind if I said I didn't think that one of them really came off. Yeah, well, I think this will be more carefully done hopefully, hmm. and um, the whole purpose, I think, that w what's going to be terribly difficult is when, when you have, for instance, the, the scenes with the dead, with Dancing Williams and uh, uh, Joseph Jarvis and hmm. so on. Hmm. Uh, the, how quite one does that, I don't know, but that's, you know, I'm not even involved in that. That's the director's problem. And, uh, but anyway, it's, it's perfectly beautiful as it is. Indeed, I agree with you. I love it. Uh, the first production on radio was in 1954, I believe, wasn't it? What are your recollections of that first production? I was working at the Old Vic, and uh, I was playing, of course, every night, different plays, the Hamlet, Coriolanus, Toby Belch, and things like that, and rehearsing during the day for the next production. So I couldn't go to rehearsals. <laughs> and you can imagine doing this first piece of, of Dylan's uh, virtually at sight reading. Mm. Uh, you know, the cobblestone, honey, and the cob and the... <laughs> <laughs> and live, too. Live, it wasn't recording. Now, I've heard a rumour, I don't know whether it's true, but that originally Dylan wrote first voice for himself and the second voice for you. Well, I like to think that's so, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm perfectly sure that he wrote the first voice for himself. And I'm perfectly sure that he wrote uh, Captain Cat for um, Hugh Griffith. And I like to think, at least he said so, but you know, he, he would say a great many things if he wanted a fiver, mm. <laughs> uh, that he wrote the second voice for me. And however, uh, I tell people that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lovely story. Now, you've already mentioned on television that there was no sentiment involved in your partaking in this film, but. Uh, the question of percentages and fees you don't want to know about. But I, I do think that an actor is involved, especially you and Under Milkwood, as much as it, you've been together with it since the outset. Uh, didn't the question of budget and who was playing the different characters, and didn't you want to be more involved than an ordinary actor would have been in this part? I suppose so. It's very difficult to say. Um, certainly, uh, when... Uh, Mr. Sinclair uh, came along with the, and said he had the rights to the film and so on, which I tried to get for many years, mm -hmm. uh, and I found impossible. When he said that, um, would you do it? And I wrote back to him immediately, and so I know it so well, and I'm very proud of it and all that. But um, I said I can't afford more than about five days because I have to leave and do another film and so on. He wrote back and he said it won't take you more than five days, so I was snapped up. And of course, we, uh, with Mr. Sinclair and Mr. French, who's producer too, uh, we have um, some ownership of it, you know. If it's successful, if it's not, we don't get anything. If it is, we we'll perhaps make a penny or two. But no, I think the basic and fundamental thing is that it is sentimental. It is um, because I want to do Dylan, I want to play. Him. I want to show him some respect, and because I'm a Welshman, and etc. You know. Well, that, that's what I thought, and that's why I was surprised to see you on television uh, last week, saying you know that uh, there was no sentiment involved. Because I think there is, isn't there, really? Oh yes, fundamentally there must be. Uh, but you were quite happy to, to put all your trust in somebody else. You didn't have your your favourite characters, for instance, in uh, in Milkwood. You well, I, I have suggested some people to play the parts, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, David Havard and uh, Peter O'Toole, and of course my wife. 
uh, actually, uh, I didn't have to suggest her. She suggested herself because she absolutely adores the part of Rosie Probert, which, of course, she's going to play uh, with Peter O'Toole. That's going to be a happy day. <laughs> Now, you've already m mentioned on television, too, the fact that uh, Dylan was a slightly awkward character, that you weren't really a friend of his, more um, you, me you met him and you knew him. When he died, or just before he died, had you discussed uh, Mirkwood with him, and the possibility of...? Well, no, but I heard him talk about it a great deal, but you know, we never discussed it in detail or anything like that. And usually, anyway, both Dylan and myself were profoundly drunk at the time. <laughs> I don't suppose he can remember even in the grave what we discussed. I, I never actually met Dylan, but as a Dylan lover, whenever I meet somebody who did, I always ask them you know, loads of questions. And I get sort of conflicting reports, really. Some people say he was an extrovert and some people say he was an introvert. What do you feel about this? Well, I think he was both. I think it depended on what time of day you caught him. <laughs> uh, if, as he once did, uh, stay with me in London, uh, the, the early mornings were, uh, you found a very shy, withdrawn creature, and, and then perhaps by lunchtime you found a very different, more ebullient gentleman, and then by six o'clock at night you found uh, uh, a man who danced naked in the streets, <laughs> and by 10 o'clock at night you picked him up and carried him home. So he was, uh, he was a great many things. Mm.